Three cuts. We're going to talk about Abraham. And Abraham's got his three cuts, chapters 12 and following with Abraham, 12 and 25. The first cut that Abraham has to make is with his own family. The Lord had said to Abraham, leave, this is the call of Abraham, this is the call of Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to a land that I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and I will bless those that bless you and curse those who curse you. Okay? Abraham, first cut, he's got to leave his family. By the way, is it hard to leave one's family? Now, you guys are from America. We move all over the place. You say, no, it wasn't hard at all. I come to Gordon College. It's good. To... Okay. When you were raised in those cultures, when you were reared in the same family, all your brothers and sisters, your cousins, your nephews, your father and mother only, not only live there, but your grandfather, your grandmother, and all their siblings live in the same town. Question. When you left that kind of a village, was it a big deal to leave? It was a big deal to leave. And God says, the first thing he says to Abraham, leave. Who's going to be your family now? Basically, God is going to lead him to a land and show him a new land and stuff. So the cutting of family ties is a big deal. Why is it that when God calls people so often, there's this leaving behind of something? When he calls people, there's often this leaving of something. Moses has to leave the Sinai Desert and go back into Egypt and things. So this, this is a common thread that happens quite frequently in Scripture, this cutting of family ties. Now, in chapter 14, uh, Abraham is out chasing down. Do you remember Lot? Do you remember Lot was Abraham's like nephew or whatever? And Lot and Abraham split. And then there's this king, Catalemer, comes down and, and basically runs off, kidnaps Lot, and he hauls Lot and his family off. And Abraham gets his 318 guys. They go out there. They capture this king. They recapture Lot. And he's coming back. He actually is victorious. Abraham is victorious. He comes back, and as he's coming back, Abraham runs into this guy, just out of the clear blue, he runs into this guy called Melchizedek. Okay, you guys call him Melchizedek. Melchi, Melchi means king, Zedek means righteousness, king of righteousness. So he runs into Melchizedek, the king of righteousness, Melchizedek. By the way, Melchizedek is king of what city? By the way, this is important too. Yeah, he's, he's the king of Salem. He's king of Salem. But in Hebrew, you say city of, you say Jeru, Salem. And if you say Jeru, city of, Salem, and you say Jeru, Salem, very fast, you get what? Jerusalem. This guy is king of Jerusalem before kind of like Jerusalem was the city of David and all this stuff was nothing. Uh, Melchizedek is king of David, uh, king of the city of, um, city of Jerusalem. Melchizedek shows up. What does Abraham do to this guy? Abraham gives him a tenth of everything he has. This guy is not only king, but he's also a priest. So he's a priest and he's a king. And he's a priest of the Most High. And Abraham pays him a tenth of everything he has. Does Abraham honor this guy? Yes. Now, somebody in the last class asked me, they said, well, in the book of Hebrews, is Melchizedek Jesus? Is Melchizedek pre-incarnate Christ? Some people think that Melchizedek was a pre-incarnate Christ. I kind of back off from that myself. I, I kind of think that this, this guy is a king and a priest, and so he typifies Christ. He's like Christ in the Old Testament, but he's not really Jesus. He appears out of nowhere, and then actually after chapter 14, we never hear about the guy again. He's gone. So he just kind of appears. Abraham pays him a tenth, and then boom, he's gone again. So um, some people think it's Christ. I think it probably just typifies Christ, that there's a person who, who is a priest and a king like Jesus would be. And so that's why he does you know, similar things with Jesus. But there's different approaches that Hebrews picks that up as a thing. So that's Genesis Melchizedek, kind of an interesting thing. Um, the honest truth is we don't really don't know. He's kind of a, he just appears and disappears in the text. The point of why I raise this is, though, that this. In the Old Testament, is it only the Jews that know God? In the Old Testament, is it only the Jews that know God? Question, did Melchizedek, was he Jewish? No. Abraham, like, didn't have any kids yet, okay? So he can't be Jewish, okay? The guy's not Jewish, okay? And does he know God? Does he know the Most High God? Yes. Does Abraham honor him for knowing the Most High God? Yes. So what I'm suggesting is that in the Old Testament, don't think that it's just the Jews. God's just dealing with the Jews. There are other people that are going to pop up in the text that you're going to read that these guys out of nowhere come and they know, they know Jehovah God. So that's interesting to me. Here's a guy who's non-Jewish who knows God. He's a priest of the Most High God. He's a king. 
in Jerusalem. Now, another cut here is in chapter 15, and this is a, this is a tough one. In chapter 15, down about verse 10 or so, as the sun was setting, verse 12, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, thick and a, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. What would that be? They will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. Yeah. Does God tell Abraham beforehand that his descendants are going to go into Egypt for 400 years and be mistreated and enslaved? God tells him that ahead of time. And then he says, and God comes and tells him some other things, and then he says, basically, I can't give you the land yet because the sin of the Amorites is not yet full. So Abraham, I'm going to give you this land, but I can't give it to you yet because the sin of the Amorites is not yet full. What is the implication? Is God saying that the sin of the Amorites is getting fuller and fuller, and when it reaches a certain level, then he's going to bring in the Jews to destroy them, but it's not yet full, so they can't have the land. And verse 17 of chapter 15, when the sun had set, darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. Abraham had to cut this animal in two. Abraham cuts this animal in two, and then this blazing fire pot goes between the two parts of the animal. Now, is it obviously something symbolic is going on here? Something symbolic is going on. And, and it turns out that we, we've got a good guess at what this sea means. There's two things that could be. One is, as this animal used to be one, as this animal used to be one, it's now cut in two, as this animal used to be one, now God and Abraham are made one in the covenant. By the way, do we have covenants even till this day where, where two are made one in a covenant? Just think about that. Are there, we have covenants today where two are made one in a covenant today. Yeah, marriage, okay? And so what you have is this covenant where God and Abraham are being bonded together in union, symbolized that this, as this animal was one, now we are becoming one, and uh, that's possible. Has anybody ever done this? And you guys probably don't do this in your generation, but in my generation, we had this thing called Blood Brothers. And so Dave Remus and I, basically when we were younger, we cut ourselves, don't do that. Well, actually, you guys do this slashing stuff. So anyways, but anyway, so... <laughs> Sorry, sorry. I just, that was a joke. That was a joke. Chill out, okay? That was a joke. All right. But the honest truth is, so Remus and I, basically, Remus and I wanted to be blood brothers, okay? We were, we were really good friends. He was like my best friend. We wanted to be blood brothers. And so he cut himself, I cut himself, and we swapped blood. Don't do that today. But anyways, we didn't know any better back then, and so we swapped blood. So as Dave Remus, is he like my blood brother for life? You know what I'm saying? This is, anyways. So this idea of blood bonding things together, is what I guess I'm trying to say, okay? So, now, there's another approach to this, and I think the second one is probably more accurate. And what this is, is it jumps off of Jeremiah chapter 34, verse 18. And the symbol that's used in Jeremiah is that this animal is cut in two, that is, if you violate the covenant, you will be cut in two like this animal. If you violate the covenant, you will be cut in two like this animal. And so this is called the ratifying of the covenant. Um, how do we ratify covenants today? Have you guys ever been to the bank and you get a, you get a, like a, a notary and a notary like does that thing on the paper and, and makes it and stuff? That's like ratifying the covenant, okay? It's like approving it, you know, when the, they stamp on it and it's good. So this is the ratification or solemnizing of the covenant. As this animal was one, was cut in two, if you violate the covenant, you'll be cut in two. Now what happens with that? Who passes between the two parts? God does. And so what God is doing here is binding himself to Abraham. The, the smoking fire pot represents God, possibly. And, and then what it's saying here is that God is binding himself to Abraham in this covenant. That God will keep his covenant. Now, by the way, what is the covenant of God? God promised Abraham three things. They are the land, the promised land, the land of Canaan. The seed, that his seed would be multiplied as the what? Stars of the heaven that his seed would be multiplied as the sand of the seashore, and that he would be what? He would be a blessing to all nations. So the land, the seed, and that he would be a blessing to all nations. God promised that to Abraham, and in this process of the cutting of the animal and the fire pot going in between, God is saying, I will keep my covenant. I make this covenant with you. I will be bound by this covenant to keep, you will get the land, the seed, and the blessing. And so this is a ratifying of the covenant 
where God participates in that. Now, there's one more cut, and this is the cut of the flesh in Genesis chapter 6, 17. Uh, this, um, I need to tell you a little story why I'm bringing this up, but anyways, once upon a time I taught at another school for 22 years, a place called Grace College. It was a very conservative school, very um, you know, God-centered, Bible-centered uh, school, and I had down front, there was this girl who, would, who sat there. You know, you ever see the students, and they take every word down what you say, and they kind of like, oh, I just believe every Professor Hildebrandt, you know, and stuff when I was younger, I could get away with it. Anyways, and so she was really into it, and she, you know, to write everything down. She was really into the class and stuff. And so we were going over this stuff about Genesis chapter 17, and this girl raises her hand, and she says, Professor Hildebrandt, it says in this chapter that uh, Abraham was circumcised and circumcises his son. What is that anyway? Now, my first thing was, okay, question, do students set professors up and want to argue and stuff? And I, to be honest, I enjoy that. Question, I look her straight in the face, and I'm expecting this little smirk on her face, you know, like, hey, I got you down, man. What are you going to do? And, and so I look at her, and she gives me this blank look, like she's so and it's just like ready to write down the answer. <laughs> I'm saying, holy cow. So she's really asking me like Bamet. I mean, in truth, she's asking me. I'm thinking, oh, I could just see it now, man. Hillebrand gets fired for drawing pictures on the board. <laughs> I'm do that. Okay. And so I said, oh. So I go home that night. I go home that night and I tell my wife, I said, you can't believe it. This girl, Bliko Bouchard, as the Hebrews say, in front of the whole class, man, this girl asked me what circumcision is. I go, can you believe that? My wife turns to me and she says, she says, you know, when I was in about seventh or eighth grade, she said, I didn't know what it was either. She said, I went and asked the pastor what it was. I thought, holy cow, this is pretty weird. And, uh, and, and then I realized, are most males now circumcised at, at birth almost? And, and what I'm saying is a lot of guys even, you know what I'm saying, that circumcision is not even a thing. So anyways, let me just go through that to say that the, basically what it is, is at the end of the male penis, there's a, a skin that hangs out about a half inch. And so what happens is the doctor cuts it off and, and basically cuts that, for, it's called the foreskin, cuts that foreskin off. Now, by the way, when you, that happens when you're a baby. Now, by the way, I know this, for, I had two boys. And so when they do it to a baby, I'm, I'm in there, I'm going, oh, you know. And the doctor, when the doctor does it to a baby, do they even whimper? I'm not kidding you. I had more of a problem with it than my sons did. It was like it was over and they did babies barely whimper. I don't know, man. Try that on an 18 year old. Is that a problem? That's, by the way, in the Bible, is that going to be a problem later on? By the way, was Abraham circumcised or does Abraham get circumcised now at 75? Is that a problem? That's a problem. Okay, so anyway, so just some things to need to think of. By the way, is this circumcision, is this a big deal? Is circumcision how the Jews identify themselves? Are the Jews of the circumcision? And if you're a Gentile, you're what? Uncircumcised? Have you ever heard that terminology? Uncircumcised Gentiles. So that's how the Jews used it as an ethnic marker of how you're in Judaism. Now, by the way, did other cultures circumcise besides the Jews? Yes, other cultures did. But is God saying here, while other cultures also circumcised, circumcision for you means a sign of the covenant? That this is how the seal, it is sealed, the covenant is sealed in your flesh. Now let me just go over here for a second and just do, um, are, are any of you from Presbyterian background? If Presbyterians baptize children, and let me, um, actually let me bounce and just get some of this stuff up here. So on circumcision, and this becomes an unconditional covenant, okay, the land, seed, and the blessing. Are some of you from Presbyterian background, and by the way, in the Presbyterian background, do they baptize babies? Yes, they do. Do you realize it's on the basis of circumcision? They were supposed to be circumcised on the eighth day. Now, did that circumcision show that they were part of the covenant community? The circumcision of the young child showed that they were part of the covenant community. The Presbyterians, when they baptize babies, are they saying that our babies, like, like circumcision, and in baptism, our babies are part of the covenant community? of believers in Christ. And is that why they baptize babies, infants? To, to basically welcome those infants into the covenant community. Now, by the way, are some of you Baptists? You don't baptize babies, okay? But can you see why the Presbyterians would do that, okay? That like circumcision in the Old Testament, baptism in the New, you're including those infants into the covenant community, okay? So that's kind of where that comes from and some of that stuff. Abraham's covenant, land, seed, and the blessing. Yes, sir. 
Yeah. Once Abraham has circumcised himself and his child, the condition is unconditional. That is, Abraham has fulfilled the conditions of the covenant, which means then that God is obligated for the land, the seed, and the blessing. That is an unconditional covenant now. It's, it's, it, the Abrahamic covenant is unconditional. Now, when you get into Moses' covenant, did they have to obey and to get blessings and cursings? Did they have to obey it? And then if they disobeyed, they get the curses. With Abraham, it's over. The covenant is unconditional. So God will work with Abraham's descendants. They will get the land, the seed, and the blessing. Now, there's going to be other covenants that are, un, that are conditional, that are conditioned on their obedience, of, like the Mosaic covenant thing. So there'll be other things. So I just wanted, this is, once he's circumcised, that's it. The covenant's fulfilled. 